Right guys, today we're going to be doing a 2JZ GE VBTI into an IS200 plug and play. So, let's do this. Right, so as I said, this is a 2JZ GE VBTI from a GS300. This harness is going to be plug and play into an IS200 and it's also using the manual gearbox from the IS200 as well. So what we're going to do is, as you can see, this is an adapted harness. So first thing we're going to do today is we're going to go through the whole build process. And what I mean by that is we're going to go through the photos so you can see that we strip the whole thing down, remove everything that's no longer necessary and add in all the stuff that is necessary and make all the changes inside the ECU box there to make it plug and play. So let's do that now. I'll be back in a second. Right, so as you've seen how everything is made, let's jump into what we're going to be doing today. So obviously the first thing we're going to do is the entire layout of the harness. So we're going to go through where all the plugs plug in, help the customers when they come to install the harness back in their car. And then we're going to go through the testing, which is made up of two sections, one with just the ignition on and the other with the engine actually running itself. Obviously it's not going to be running without the inlet manifold and the throttle on, but we have this off to go through the layout with you guys so it's easier to see. So as part of the layout, we're going to start right here at the ECU box and then we're going to work our way from there. So starting over here, the main one is we've got the ECU plug. So those are one, two, three, four, five, and six, all uniquely keyed. So you can't get the wrong one in the wrong place. You don't have to stress about that at all. It all just plugs straight in. Then we have our Atomu device or automatic transmission emulator. Now, unfortunately with the GS300s, we can't remap these ECUs like the IS300. So we still have to utilize this to get rid of all the gearbox codes. Now that's running in a manual configuration. We then also have the MPX translator. So that's gonna translate the MPX data from the GS300 ECU into the IS200 so that everything works exactly as it should. We then have our adapted section over here and that is a little sort of patch harness that we do to interface with the two IS200 plugs so you don't have to change anything on your IS200. Moving along from there we then have our three body plugs so these are where the harness interfaces with the vehicle itself apart from these two over here obviously but normally there'd be a blue and a gray and a black plug now in this case because we reused the GS300 plugs it's now a white plug over there a slightly cream plug over there and another white plug over there so don't fret they cannot go into each other. They are uniquely keyed. So again, you can't plug the wrong one into the wrong thing. So you don't have to stress about that. And then lastly, we've got our little junction plug, which can be tucked away onto here on your IS200 when you get it back on your side. Right, so from there we have our grommet and that goes into this little U-shape hole over here. So again, really, really nice and simple. No dramas there. Other side of the grommet, we have a couple of things breaking out, starting with these three sections over here that go to our resistors. So these get rid of the last codes of the gearbox that are left over, even with the Atomu connected. If you've seen our Atomu installation videos, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But yeah, so the reason that they're outside and quite a long harness over here is that they get incredibly hot, okay? Uh, and I do mean really, really hot. So obviously we can't put them inside the ECU box because they might melt wires and melt plastic and so on and so forth. So we keep them on the outside. Um, obviously everything is sort of sealed up with SCL heat shrink. So basically what we advise that you do is in an ideal world, get a piece of aluminium, bolt these three to that piece of aluminium. Um, that'll act as like a heat sink. And then you can actually mount it if you want sort of down here or on top of the strut or wherever you want to over there. The second piece that comes out here after the grommet is going to be our igniter. So remember these are dumb coils that run on the 2JZ GE VBTI. And obviously they require an igniter to fire them and that's where that plugs in. Now on the IS300, this is normally the station where you would obviously have your igniter plugged into. So again, you can plug it right here on top of the strut tower and it's plenty long enough from the edge of the grommet over here. All right, just ignore this one for a second. It actually comes out down there, but basically your harness will come along, come along, come along. 
and then it's gonna make its way into the first piece of plastic over here. And this is bolted down over here with a little 10 mil socket. You can then tighten that down over there. And what we're gonna do now is the harness goes that way, it goes that way, and then also goes down. So what I'm gonna do is we're gonna start by going this way, then we'll come back, go that way, and then we'll have a look underneath and see where all the connectors are there. So, first thing you're gonna notice is a very weird setup. So basically, this customer wanted the ability to be able to swap injectors out. So what we've basically done is we've changed all the injector wires and we've terminated them to a 12-pin DTM plug, okay? So what he's got now is we've made him a little sub harness with just the normal injector plugs on that you would get on any sort of 2JZ GE VVTi with what we call the Denso plugs over there. And then we've also actually made him one with an EV1 connector as well. So that obviously he has the ability then to unplug this and plug in different injectors if he so desires, because I know he wants to upgrade further down the line. So we've just put that in for him so he can do that without any major issues at all. All right. Then the harness carries on along here and it gets to our second piece of plastic, but just before it does, it has three little sections that break out. So the first one is going to be to our oil control valve. So that's for the VVTi. So again, that comes directly out of there and goes into there. We then have our TPS connector. That's gonna go into the throttle body when that is sitting over there. So you'll see that when the throttle comes back on, we do the test when it's running. Then we've got our noise filter plug and that again plugs in over here onto the, um, onto the oh, this way, sorry, onto the uh, inlet manifold when that goes back on as well. So you'll see that plugged in when that goes on. All right, then obviously you've got all your injector plugs and you see in this case, they're color coded as per standard. So it's gonna be brown, gray, brown, gray, brown, gray. But in actual fact with these ones, they are actually all labeled for the customer because it's a harness we build brand new. Okay. So moving those out of the way. Now then, on this whole plastic thing, you don't see it here, but if you have a look underneath there, you're gonna see there's a little piece of plastic that bolts down through there and then drops the wiring through underneath there, okay? So that is now where we are going to go. And the first section that pops out over there is gonna be this little connector here. So this little connector here is actually for a power steering pressure switch. Okay, so the ECU receives a signal when the power steering pressure goes up beyond a certain point. So in the olden days before the drive-by wire, like with this one with the ETCSI, what they would normally do is either put like a valve on the power steering pump with some vacuum hoses to allow vacuum to come from the inlet, from the, the air pipe into the inlet manifold to pick up the RPM when you have sort of full lock on power steering. Now what they do is they basically use one of those with a pressure switch, it then activates, the ECU gets then told that the pressure steering is high, and because it's drive-by wire, it can then lift up the RPM in that particular case. So that's basically what that does over there. All right, it's quite a long wire, so that goes over there. So the next one that pops out over here is gonna be this one, which is our ACIS vacuum solenoid valve. So you see this little black canister underneath here, that's for your ACIS system, which will go through, and I'll actually have a links in the description about how the ACIS system works as well. We also have an earth strap, which bolts directly onto there. Remember your big metal pole that goes from the um, block up to here to obviously strengthen the inlet manifold. That would normally be here, and the earth is gonna bolt on directly there where you see my thumb is over there. Okay, I'm gonna see if I can get underneath here now. Just hang on a second. But if you can see just about there where my finger is, that is your knock sensor. So that also comes out over here. So it's a little bit difficult to see, but if you see where my fingers are, you can see that goes down over there. And then you can see there, there's the knock sensor that plugs in over there. And then you have your starter motor solenoid plug that goes in over there. So that runs along there. And then, as I said, this is your power steering pressure switch. Just bring it up. It's quite a long one. So there you go. So perfectly easy. Okay, so that's that section over there. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna move along here and then it's gonna break out at the end over here. Nice and simple, it's just going straight to your cam sensor plug over there. It's then going to your EVAP or um, plug that goes in over there, your charcoal canister. So that's gonna go over there. That is obviously on the inlet manifold, so you will see that plugged in actually when we have the inlet manifold back on. Also coming out here is the gearbox sub harness. So again, we have sub harness these off because we know you guys like to change your mind. So again, gearbox, gearbox over there. And in this case, it's using the J160. So we've got our speed and our reverse over there as well. Okay, so if the customer ever wanted to change his mind and go with like a BMW gearbox, we can just unplug this and then plug in a BMW reverse switch. Remember, BMWs do not have speed. So we can only do a reverse switch for those gearboxes and obviously every other type of gearbox that you can imagine. Okay, so that is that whole section over there. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna make our way over the top over here. So it is a plastic piece. It does sit in this cavity or channel like this. Okay, so really, really nice and simple. 
I'm gonna move over to this side over here. But as it comes along here, we're gonna break out. And the first one is for our coils. So you can see there, we've got a coil plug there. We've got a coil plug there, and we've got a coil plug there. Now, very easy. You can't really mix it up because of the distances. That one's not gonna plug in there. And if you plug that one in there, then that one's just gonna be dangling around. So they're kind of self-explanatory with that to get them all in the correct place, okay? Then the plastic section moves along to here, goes around here, and then you can see it's actually bolted on over there to keep it in place. Coming out of here, we then have our drive-by-wire motor plug, which again will plug into the drive-by-wire motor over here. We then also, coming further down, we have our accelerator position sensor. So remember, these are drive-by-wire, they're not um, uh, cable throttles at all. Even though they run with a cable, the cable's actually just turning an accelerator position sensor, which this is the plug for over there. And then lastly, we have our Lambda sensor plug over there. So that is for bank two, four, five, and six, sensor number one. Okay, so that's where that one goes in over there. All right, so that's, that's that section over there. The rest of it pops down over here, pops out along here, and then you'll see we've got our crank sensor plug over there. So remember the crank sensor goes down to behind the crank pulley over there. We then have our alternator plugs. So that's the three wire plug over there. We then also have our lambda sensor for bank one. So that's one, two, three, bank one, sensor one over there, okay? We then also have our mass airflow sensor plugs. So that's gonna come into the pipe over here or wherever it ends up over there, okay? And then lastly with this one, again, because we can't remap it, so we can't get rid of the secondary lambda sensors. So we've got our bank one, one, two, three, sensor two. Okay, so that's normally where that lambda sensor would be over there. In most cases, I think it's a little bit further down. So this is kind of designed to run along the frame over here and then plug into that one over there, okay? Now, because we can't get rid of the secondary lambda sensors, the lambda sensor that's underneath the vehicle also needs to be installed. Don't worry about it. All the wiring is taken care of as part of the patch harness over there. So there's nothing you need to do, but you do need to keep it in the exhaust. That's all that you basically need to do just to make sure that the signals are getting there because obviously we cannot get rid of those, unfortunately, without the remapping right so that's that section over there so as i said we've got one more section which is coming down so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to get down here and then hopefully we're going to see everything that's going on there so you can see it comes just outside here so there's still your plastic section over there pops down over there goes over here to your oil pressure switch so that's that one over there i'm going to try and move this out the way but you can see where my finger is that is your coolant temperature sensor and move that out of the way and then that is your knock sensor over there where my finger is over there so that's the knock sensor over there. The also have an earth strap, which makes its way up to over here. And then again, bolted down. And then coming further along here down, we then have our aircon pump, which that goes over there. And then right here at the bottom, we have our oil level sensor as well. So that is plugged in over there. Really nice and straightforward. Okay. Right, so I think that pretty much covers everything for here. Like I said, you're gonna see a couple of other things like the accelerator position and the drive-by-wire motor, the TPS and the noise filter, and the charcoal canister vacuum solenoid valve, that is all gonna be plugged in when the inlet manifold is actually in. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna shoot off, we're gonna put the inlet manifold, throttle body, everything back on, get everything plugged in, and let's get into the testing of this harness. So I'll see you in a minute. Right guys, so now we're gonna be doing the uh, testing of the engine harness, and as I said, it's gonna be made up of two sections. So first is with the ignition on, and the other one is with the engine running over there. So first thing I'm gonna do, we're gonna go through all the tests that we are gonna carry out today, and then we'll jump into the test with the ignition on. So. Starting from the very top here, obviously we have removed the immobilizer in the ECU, so we're gonna make sure that that works. So basically all we're doing is inserting the key and making sure that security light goes off. I do have a very good video explaining the immobilizer system. Uh, if you want more details about how it works in an IS200, IS300, GS300, et cetera, um, you can go and find that video on my channel. But next up, we're gonna be testing the ambient temperature. So we wanna make sure that the outside temperature is coming through, and we're gonna be looking over here at the um, climate controls. That'll give us the outside temperature. Then we're gonna come back and we're gonna look at the check engine light, the charge light, and the oil pressure light. So again, the check engine light's gonna be up there, battery light's over there, oil pressure light's gonna be over there. So we wanna make sure that they all come on. And obviously when we start the engine later on, we make sure that all of them go off. That's also what we're looking for there as well. Once we've done that, we're then gonna move and we're gonna look at the reverse and the speedo. So basically what I'm gonna do is, remember this one is using a manual gearbox. So I'm gonna bridge the reverse switch over there. You're gonna hear the usual beeping sound from the cluster in the IS200. And if you watch any of the other videos, you can see that I'm going to then feed the signal for the speed sensor. So again, we can see the clocks on the dash showing a speed indication when I force feed a signal into the plug there. Okay. 
After you've done that, then we're gonna pop over to the OBD2 machine, make sure it's communicating. I'll show you that it's actually picking up as a GS300, et cetera, and then we'll see all of the live data from the engine. So things like coolant temp, intake, air temp, throttle position, all of that type of jazz. Then next up, we're gonna test the AC system. So basically what I'm gonna be testing is two things. One is the AC clutch. So in this case, the GS200 ECU is controlling the air conditioning. It does require all of the stuff to be connected correctly in the standardized 200 for it to work, obviously. So basically what I'm looking to do is effectively test the AC clutch. So I'll go back into the OBD2 machine. I'm gonna tell the ECU to turn on the AC magnetic clutch relay, which will then provide 12 volts to the AC clutch itself. And you actually hear that clutch click as well as the relay click when I do that. Next up, I'm gonna go inside the car over here and I'm gonna press the AC button. And what I'm looking for, we'll go over to the live data and we'll see that the AC signal has turned from off to on so that we know that the ECU is accepting the signal because as I said, we've got an MPX converter device on there. So it's converting the MPX data from the IS200 to work with the GS300. So we wanna make sure that all of that is working. And also that's why things like the coolant temp, the check engine light, battery light, oil light, all of that, we need to make sure all of that's working because that's part of the MPX system. All right, so that's pretty much all the tests with the ignition on and then we're gonna move over to with the engine running. So nice and simple, start a circuit. Basically what I wanna see is when I turn the key inside the car, that obviously the car starts, okay? That tells me that when you have it on your side as a customer, you're gonna plug everything in as you see in the ECU box over there. When you jump in your car and turn the key, this thing should crank over, okay? So that's what I'm testing there. Next up is gonna be the ACIS. So the ACIS, or Acoustic Control Induction System, that's that little valve that you see over there. So basically I wanna see that little valve move. Okay, I can do it by either revving it up, but I can also test it through the machine over here, and that's normally what I will do for you guys. Next up is gonna be drive-by-wire test. So again, that's super simple. Now, ETCSI is actually drive-by-wire. So as you can see here, this is an accelerator position sensor or accelerator pedal position sensor. That's why you have that plug over there. There's your TPS over there. Obviously, the throttle blade is in the middle over here. So actually, when you're turning this one, you're not actually turning the throttle blades until you get to the very last section. So if you have a listen now, but that whole section over there, you're not even touching the throttle blade. It is fully drive-by-wire even though you are using a cable, okay? So what I wanna do is I wanna rev that just a little bit so you can actually see that effectively that is working because obviously if I move it just like this and the engine actually revs, then clearly drive-by-wire is working. If it doesn't work, it won't rev until I move it to there and then I can go a little bit like that. All right. Next up is gonna be the oil control valve test for the VVTi. So basically what we're looking at there is we've got our oil control valve over here. We're gonna use our machine to test it. Unfortunately, it does kill the engine because it's a straight six and it's obviously got one set of cams, unlike the user with the V8, I can test one side and the other side. So obviously I'll test that, but if it dies, that is exactly what I wanna see happen. I want to see the engine die because it tells me the oil control valve is working and it's advancing and retarding the cams as it should do. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna move over to testing the injectors and coils. And basically how I do that effectively is I'm gonna just disconnect the injectors one by one. And then what we're gonna do is listen for the misfire. That's what I'm looking for. It tells me that every single cylinder is firing exactly as it should. Obviously with a wasted spark system, if I just undid the coils, I would only know that uh, two cylinders are working correctly, but obviously I wouldn't know about the injectors. So I always just remove the injectors in this case, just to get a good misfire on each and every single cylinder. Once we've done that, we're gonna pop back over here and we're gonna make sure that we're getting an RPM signal from there. So remember the GS300 ECU is also giving out a six cylinder signal, so there's no need for adaption or uh, correction there. So we're just feeding the signal straight from the GS100 system into the IS200. And then we wanna see the coolant temperature gauge go up because again, that's part of the MPX system. So we wanna make sure that, that is working because normally if you plug in a GS100 ECU, that's one of the things that doesn't work where the MPX differs between the GS and the um, IS200 slash IS300. And once we've done that, then we'll go through the diagnostics, what you can and what you can't do with the diagnostics on this particular setup. Obviously we have OBD2, clearly we'll be testing in the beginning there, but we'll go through all the other stuff that you guys can do as well. So now that we've gone through that, let's jump into testing with the ignition on. And the first thing we wanna test is the immobilizer removal. So in order to test the immobilizer removal, it is super easy. You can see we've got our security light flashing over there. And literally all I'm gonna do, I've kept most of the system intact. Obviously we removed the immobilizer on the ECU, but as soon as I insert the key, you can see the security light stops flashing. And as you'll notice, I've not even turned the ignition on. So that is, a, that is how that system works. It's already picking up the key or not picking up the key in this case, but I've, obviously I've removed the immobilizer, but it should 
give you a security light like it would normally. So people walking by are gonna think that you still have an immobilizer when in actual fact you don't. Okay, so that's the immobilizer done. So that's nice and simple. So now let's turn the key on. And what we're looking for now is obviously the ambient temperature and you can see there it's displaying 13 degrees. So that is absolutely fine and that is exactly what I'm looking for for that test over there. Moving over here, you can see now we've got check engine light, we've got battery light and we've got oil light. So that is all working 100%. So now we wanna move over to our reverse switch over here. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm just going to bridge the reverse switch. Hopefully you can see there. And you can hear that annoying beep over there. So that's absolutely fine. So the reason I tested from the terminals is to make sure the circuit's absolutely 100%. So I know that from here all the way into the car and eventually would all the way to the reverse lights at the back, the whole circuit is completely intact. Um, it's just the way that I like to do it because I know from terminal to terminal is absolutely fine. Next up, let's do the speedo. So as I said, I've, if you watch any of my other videos, uh, you've seen this a hundred times already. So basically what all I'm doing is I'm testing a multitude of things here. Number one, my little device needs power and ground. Because this is a Hall Effect sensor, it receives 12 volts on pin one, a ground on pin two. That ground comes from the cluster to avoid ground loops. And then you've got the yellow wire, which I'm gonna put in there, so that's gonna output a signal. Now, obviously, I have to put it into the test output mode, which I will do now, and then we'll do that. So just bear with me a second while I do that. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so basically what I'm looking for now is I'm gonna supply the yellow wire to the signal wire. And as I do that, there you go, straight away, you can see that that is working exactly as it should do. Okay, so again, it's exactly the same principle. I'm literally just using the wires going into the plug to make sure that from terminal to terminal, the circuit is completely intact. Now then, obviously you guys don't have one of these to hand and you probably won't. Uh, so what I would advise guys, when you are doing the installs, if for whatever reason your speed is not working, uh, there is a really nice, easy way to try and determine where the fault is, whether it's with the sensor or whether there's something possibly wrong that's happened with the wiring during installation or whatever. Um, really easy way to test it is basically get underneath, leave the speed sensor plugged in, but unbolt it from the gearbox, pull it out, grab a drill, literally tape the drill to the speed sensor, and then get your friend or whatever to sit inside the vehicle with the ignition on, and then you spin the drill. If, if the speed works on the dash, then straight away you know there's a problem inside the gearbox. If the speed doesn't work, then obviously it could be the speed sensor itself that's not working as well. Okay, so, but at least it helps to narrow it down for you guys to know where exactly the issue lies in relation to that, okay. Right, so now we've done speed, uh, let's do OBD2. So again, we're just gonna pop over here. And as usual, sorry for that brightness down, I'm just gonna go into function, I'm gonna go into system select. This is just so you guys can see that it's picking up as a GS300, so again, I am connected directly to the car's standard OBD2 port. There's nothing funny, there's no weird OBD2 port somewhere else. When you plug this in, you plug into the standard OBD2 port and you can read all the data through a diagnostic machine over there. Okay, so now we know it's a GS300, that's absolutely fine. So we're gonna pop into the testing that we wanna do. Sorry, it's trying to focus on the thingy there. So right now what we wanna do is we wanna test the AC clutch. So as I said there, basically what we're gonna do is we are going to test the AC magnetic clutch relay. We're gonna pop in there. And again, what we're listening for now is we're listening for the relay to click and obviously the magnetic clutch to click. So three, two, one. Okay, so I'm gonna try and then hopefully you guys can actually see Okay, so hopefully, yeah, that should be nice and gravy. So you should have heard, obviously, the relay click over there and the AC magnetic clutch, the actual clutch on the front of the AC pump. That was clicking as well when I was pressing that over there. Right, so now what we want to do is we want to see that the signal from the car is actually being interpreted by the ECU and turning on. So what we want to do now is go down all of our live data that we can see over here. And we want to find AC signal. There it is. So AC signal is now currently off. And all I'm gonna do is pop over here. We're gonna press the AC button. We're gonna move over here and you should see AC signal in a second. We'll turn to on. There you go. Sorry, when it's trying to get a lot of data right, it's incredibly slow. So I'm just gonna turn it off now. And give it a second to catch up. There you go, off. So that is perfect. So that is literally everything that I wanna see. So I know as long as the whole system is um, 
plumbed up and wired up correctly. So remember there's pressure switches and all that type of stuff. As long as those are all wired up correctly and everything is there, the ACE system will work on these particular plug and play harnesses. So that should be absolutely fine. Right, so my next job now is I'm gonna shoot off, I'm gonna get this thing running. I wanna build up some temperature in it, mainly because obviously I wanna see the coolant temperature appear on the gauge. And obviously the coolant temperature only really starts reading from about 40 degrees onwards. And as it's a cold day, I need to get it up and running for a bit so we can see that that is working exactly as we expect it to. So bear with me a second, it'll be a second for you guys. We'll see you now. Right guys, so now we're back and we're doing the testing with the engine actually running. So obviously I've got up the temperature now so we can see the coolant temperature on the dash working as well. So a quick recap of what we're gonna be doing. So start a circuit, well, pretty self-explanatory. I'm gonna stick the key in the ignition, turn it over, the engine should start. That's what we're looking for there. ACIS, we're gonna come over to our machine. We're basically gonna activate the ACIS valve, which this little valve is gonna go boom and then close and then boom and then close. I'll do it twice for you guys so you can see it. Drive by wire test, we're just gonna rev it up. Boom, and that's gonna work there. Oil control valve, we're gonna pop back to our machine. We're gonna activate the oil control valve solenoid over there. That's gonna probably kill the engine because it's up to temperature already. So the idle RPM isn't high enough to keep it running. But anyway, so as long as it dies, I'll start it up again. That's what we wanna see happening. Then we're gonna test all the injectors and coils. So I'm gonna take out one, two, three, four, five, and six each at a time. Then we're gonna hear the engine misfire and then we know that everything is 100% with that. Then we're gonna come back and we're gonna look at the taco and the coolant temp. So all we wanna see basically is that the taco is working and the coolant temperature is actually displaying some kind of temperature on. That's basically what we wanna see. Then we're gonna go through the diagnostics and what you can and can't do with this particular setup um, over here. Obviously you've got OBD2 as per our machine, but we'll go through the rest of the stuff that you can do. So without further ado, I'm gonna get my ear defenders on and let's get this thing started up. So key in the ignition, turn the key and then go nice and simple so let's go into ACIS make sure you can see that so we've got intake control vacuum soloid valve test okay so that's the ACIS let's pop over the drive-by wire Okay, so as I said, it's gonna kill the engine, so we're gonna fire up again. Rightio, so that means all control valve is working 100%. Let's go over and test our injectors and coils now. So let's pop over here. So we're gonna start with number one. Let's go to number two. Number three is just sort of down inside there. Right, number, number four is gonna be over there. Then number five is just hidden underneath here. You'll probably see it over there. And then number six is over there. Fantastic, okay, so that is all the injectors and coils working. So we can see we've got our taco signal there, we've got our temperature gauge over there, and I'll give it a quick rev. Right, so what we're going to do is diagnostics. So I'm going to quickly go just get the fuel pump so we can keep the ignition on and obviously get that thing running. Okay. Radio, so I'm going to get my ear defenders off quickly. Put them down over here. Right, so diagnostics. OBD2 machine is by far always going to be your best option. It gives you all the live data you would want. It gives you all the specific diagnostic codes and everything. Wonderful stuff. Now then, if you've noticed and you've seen my other videos, you'll know that because of the mass airflow sensor that I've got on here, this is a 98 to 2000 slash 2001 model. So AKA this one didn't have the shift up, shift down button on the automatic gearbox. Um, and that's why you've got the big mass airflow sensor. It looks like a bullet over there. If it was the next generation, it would have a small mass airflow sensor like that. So that was 01 to 05, okay? So 
What we are able to do on these particular ones is we not only can get diagnostic codes from an OBD2 machine, we can also get it the old fashioned way by flashing the check engine light codes, okay? So that's the old system where you bridge two pins. You've probably seen it loads of times online. And obviously then the check engine light will start flashing, okay? We're gonna do that in a second over there. But basically what I'm gonna do now as well is show you on the diagnostic machine here, we're gonna go DTC or diagnostic trouble codes. And you can see there at the moment, the only two codes that we actually have here is literally bank one sensor two and bank two sensor two. You can see bank one sensor two is not plugged in and obviously bank two sensor two would be under the vehicle. In this case, that is basically missing. So I would be expecting those two codes over there. So that's absolutely fine. That's exactly what I wanna see. Okay, so again, this gives you very specific codes. Now, what I'm gonna do is these two codes are gonna be 27 and 29, okay? On the flash code systems. I'm actually gonna show you how that works. So it is quite useful to have those codes available to us now. All right, so how do you do it? Basically, the normal way is on the OBD2 port that's underneath in your driver's side footwell there. You can bridge either pin four and 13 or five and 13. Basically, four and five are both grounds and 13 is TC or trouble codes, okay? So that's one way of doing it. I've got the OBD2 machine plugged in, so I'm not gonna do it that way right now. If your IS200 from about 98, 99 to 2000, 2001, you are gonna have this little diagnostics port in the front of this box. All the later model ones, this disappears, so you don't have access to this, okay? So you can't bridge the terminals in here. You have to do it in the OBD2 port. The earlier models, 99, 98, 99 to 2000, 2001, you can do both options. You can either bridge it there or you can bridge it in here. So I'm gonna bridge in here just to show you exactly what happens. So looking at our check engine light over there, you can see it light up in the corner over there and looking at our diagnostic port over here, remember we just wanna bridge ground and TC. So in this case, in the top here, we've got E1 where the wire is over there. And this one over here, my fingernail is, that is then TC. All right, so basically all we're gonna do is we're gonna bridge those together. Now, before I do that, I'm gonna move over to the check engine light to show you exactly what it's gonna do. So three, two, one. You see it goes off and then we're gonna start counting. So we've got one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that's two, two and seven, 27. Then we've got one, two, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So that's 29, and then we have a long pause, and then it's gonna go one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Right, so as you can see there, basically what's happening is it's now cycling through the code. So it does 2727, 2929, and then it'll go back off that long pause. It'll go back and go 272972, and it'll keep on doing that from there. So you can read diagnostic codes with that, and we've got a complete sheet for all our customers on there, so you can see exactly what those old codes mean as well. But that's not the only thing that you can do with that as well. So if you bridge those two terminals over there and over there, which actually works for all of them, even the UZ stuff as well, but basically you're gonna be able to check your timing, okay? So if you are under the impression that you may be a tooth off or the timing is slightly out or that something is wrong, maybe with a crank sensor or something like that, basically what you can do is you can bridge those two terminals over there and then this cable over, or this bungee cord, bogey cord, spark plug lead, whatever you guys call it, this is cylinder one. So you're gonna put your clamp around there. And if we pop down to over here, hopefully you can see we've got zero, five, 10 and 15 degrees. And then obviously you've got the corresponding mark on your crank pulley that you need to look for. Okay, now do be careful with these. There is actually two marks on there. So do make sure that you do have the correct mark and not the incorrect one before you do that. But basically what's gonna happen is if you bridge those terminals in there or in the OBD2 port, it's gonna lock the timing at 10 degrees. So you can then use your timing light to see if it's at 10 degrees. If it's not, then you can investigate further, but it means you can do it without having to pull all the cam covers off and all the pulleys off and all of that type of jazz. You can literally just check that straight away nice and easy. Okay, so diagnostic wise, OBD2 machine, best option by far. If you're in a pinch, you can bridge those two terminals and use the check engine light to check all the codes, okay? If you do bridge that thingy, please make sure for the love of mercy that you do pull it out because you're gonna lock the timing at 10 degrees and that is not ideal. You're gonna have absolutely no power whatsoever. So do make sure that you do pull that out once you finish doing your diagnosing. 
Right, but that's it, guys. Thanks for watching, obviously. This night we need to get off and get over to the customer so that he can get it on his car and get it running. Um, yeah, if you have any questions about this particular setup, please let us know. Um, if you want pricing or whatever, just let us know because we need to know exactly which one you've got, whether it's a 98 to 01 or a 01 to 05. And then obviously the difference between America and European and stuff like that. So just give us as much information as you possibly can. But again, if you do have any questions, comment down below or you can find us at Phoenix Engine Management on Facebook. Message us there or our email address is info at phoenixenginemanagement.com. And I'm going to put a whole bunch of links down in the bottom of useful information and videos that you guys can use when you are doing these kind of installs swaps anything you're doing in relation to that and again you can ask questions on those as well and if there's anything you want to see that you haven't seen in the video section please get in touch with us and we can do it the next time we have this particular setup on the bench ready to test over there but all the video all the photos now of the complete harness with all the nice fitting and everything inside the um, ecu box is coming up now so hang around for that and we'll see you again soon bye bye <laughs>